Majority Rapport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Rapport with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Seether, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Rachel M. Cohen, senior policy reporter at Vox, joins us to discuss the housing crisis in the U.S. and how state governments are responding. And later, Jessica uh, Preheim, I'll get clarification from her on how to pronounce that, of the Houston Coalition for the Homeless will be joining us to talk about what works in solving homelessness. Meanwhile, the FBI search of Trump's Mar-a-Lago home was reportedly the result of some suspiciously light boxes of classified documents that Trump returned to the National Archives after delaying for months. Speaking of that guy, he was set to face questioning under oath by the New York AG's office today in regards to the civil investigation into his businesses, but... He's reportedly invoking the Fifth Amendment. Womp womp. This is 1984. Freedom Caucus Republican Scott Perry has had his phone seized by the FBI as well. Which means that the FBI's probe into Trump's, uh, Trump probably has less to do with the uh, stealing of the classified document boxes itself and more to do with the Jan 6 stuff that could be in them. That's just conjecture but everything's coming up dark brandon new inflation numbers show no inflation in terms of last month's numbers experts believe it will likely go down from here and that we have hit the inflation peak ilhan omar defeated her centrist primary challenger in a race that was way too close for comfort last night In Vermont, Bernie endorsed progressive Becca Balint has easily won her primary for the state's sole house seat. And in Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes will officially face off against Ron Johnson in the general. Trump endorsed Republicans fared well yesterday as well. Kim Mickles will face Tony Evers in Wisconsin and election denier Kim Crockett will advance to the general election for secretary of state in Minnesota. Albuquerque police have detained a suspect in the murder of four Muslim men, a man named Mohammed Saeed. They have yet to determine a motive. And lastly, jurors in Mississippi have declined to prosecute the white woman who made false accusations against Emmett Till. She's 88 years old. And she is lucky that the justice system protected her (laughs) and no one's going to take any matters into their own hands on this front. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm in for Sam. He's taking a personal day with his kids today. Uh, I will be out on Friday, but we will have our regularly scheduled Emma Jordy report on Thursday. I'm contractually obligated to say, under threat of penalty, it is hump day. Uh, Matt and Bradley are here holding down the fort, and if the power goes out, we'll see. It's a little less hot today, so I feel like we might yeah, have a fighting chance. I'd bet against it today if uh, if you're uh, betting on if you if, if there's if you can place a bet on that. I mean, DraftKings has odds on yeah. our power outage. Uh, we'll, st- we'll stay up today. Um, but it's kind of like playing slots because we don't really know, and we also we can tilt the scales in our favor if we really wanted to. Bring it down to a cool 78 in here and then see if that power goes out. Regardless, uh, we have a really good show and I'm excited to dive deep into 
a discussion about housing and homelessness uh, here in this country. But obviously the big news and what's going to dominate much of the news cycle for a while is the FBI raid slash search of Mar-a-Lago. Now, Republicans are trying out a variety of different responses to the FBI searching Mar-a-Lago, and it's all under the same outrage food group, though. Uh, Kevin McCarthy wants Merrick Garland investigated, for example. Uh, Charlie Kirk also came out with some similar talking point about how we need to investigate George Soros and all of our other political enemies in retaliation. I am amused by how the uh, the Republicans are shocked and chagrined that the FBI might not constantly be working on behalf of centrist and conservative interests as it has done for its entirety um, in its history. Are we good, guys? Yeah? Okay. Um, so just making sure we didn't have any technical difficulties. So um, they're definitely coalescing, coalescing though, uh, behind this planted evidence narrative, I should say. And it seems to be coming from the top. Here is uh, Donald Trump's truth from Truth Social, which you better be retruthing later, Matt. Yeah, you might have to put that up. We're having a problem with the video computer. Um, okay. Uh, so, Bradley, if you can read that for Emma and I'm... I think I can read it here if I just get, let, get to the link. Um, we'll put this up in post, guys. But here is Donald Trump's uh, statement on Truth Social. The FBI and others from the federal government would not let anyone, including my lawyers, be anywhere near the areas that were rummaged and otherwise looked at during the raid on Mar-a-Lago, which I think is fairly standard. Everyone was asked to leave the premises. They wanted to be left alone without any witnesses to see what they were doing, taking or hopefully not planting. When did they strongly insist on having nobody watching them? Everybody out? Obama and Clinton were never raided, despite being... Despite big disputes, well, I mean, yes, uh, that is the case. But the reality here is that uh, they were never under investigation for potentially trying to overturn an election. Uh, amongst a variety of other improprieties that we know Donald Trump is uh, in the muck over. And I find that fascinating that they seem to all be deciding that the best way to combat this is to talk about how the evidence was planted because what you're saying there, you're essentially conceding that stuff is going to come out, <laughs> that things had been, had been found, or at the very least, the FBI will be making up um, evidence that was found in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Now we know that that's not the case, but if you're a little bit afraid about the contents that were seized... You might want to say, oh, that's just planted evidence. Uh, I, uh, I think there's a lot. Uh, I don't think the FBI has to be trusted. I, I don't think their track record is um, planting things on um, a reactionary president of the United States. I, I, I did that. To, I might have done that to other people. But think of a bit if it's a bit of a stretch. I'm, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, um, it, it, at least Trump has truth social is truth out. And, and if they were deciding to plant something, I mean, they would have probably not given him such a heads up with these multiple requests for these documents and the due diligence that was done and the discussions with his lawyers in the months leading up to what had to end up being a search of his home for what seems like the documents that he was withholding. But here also is Trump attorney Christina Bob, who... Uh, used to be an OAN anchor, <laughs> left that, and now has uh, upgraded to being Donald Trump's uh, cleanup on aisle five lady, trying to clean up his messes. But she is repeating this talking point here as well, that the FBI planted evidence or made up these allegations. Uh, play the audio. There's something wrong with the video again. Dang. So, uh, I, I don't think that there was actually anything there that's worthwhile uh, we'll see what they come up with you know if they did it'll be interesting especially since they precluded me from actually watching what they did but but at this point i don't necessarily think that they would even go to the extent of trying to plant information i think they just make stuff up 
and you know come up with whatever they want. And I, I, that's the way that they will have to proceed in order to actually try to indict the president because they, they don't have anything. There, there's just nothing there. So it's either planted or it's made up. You know, pick pick your poison, A or B. But uh, the the reality, as I keep saying, what we do know is that there's something that's going to come out from this. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Eastman's phone was confiscated by feds a few weeks ago. Then you have the uh, Republican uh, representative Perry Freedom Caucus guy who is uh, someone who assisted in the uh, attempts to overturn the election. His phone was seized when he was on a family vacation. Something is happening here, and the FBI is ramping up an investigation because they are they probably are under the impression that Donald Trump's going to run soon, and then they're precluded from actually doing anything about this. Yeah, and I just think, like, the way... Reading certain occurrence in the right, like the pro DeSantis current, it I feel like there were some people who were trying to... It, it starts to look like rats flee in the ship a little bit. Is it a coincidence that this happened in my state of Florida? I need loyalty, okay? What, I, I can't depend on you people for anything. Hey, what about states' rights? Ron, why don't you help me out here with the feds? But um, another interesting wrinkle to this as well is that People, people forget, and I didn't even realize this until this morning, but Politico wrote it up that here's the, uh, here's the quote from Politico. Um, in the absence of more detailed information about the investigation, it's unclear what presidential crimes DOJ is probing. Notably, Trump, after a fierce campaign against Clinton, in which he called for her to be jailed for her handling of classified material, signed a law in 2018 that stiffened the penalty for... The the unauthorized removal and retention of classified documents from one year to five years, turning it into a felony offense. So talk about stepping on your own rake. Oh boy. Donald Trump might have actually accidentally made himself a felon. And that would be perfect. Uh, uh, it, I mean, it, a felon in the way that the uh, government is going to take action against. I mean, I, I, I would imagine that guy is a felon in certain ways uh, many times over before that. But um, also, I think um, Marcy Wheeler made a good point about the Maggie Haberman, the very first byline about this, which like the way this is written, it's not I don't mean to be a guy that's all about objectivity in the media, but said uh, the search carried out Monday by the FBI at former President Donald J. Trump's Florida home allows a law enforcement action with explosive legal and political implications, like just an editorial right in the middle of that sentence, Yeah, um, was the culmination of a lengthy conflict between the president and Brad. I Like, I don't know. I, I do think it is weird to say explosive when you have a whole bunch of freaks um, talking about January 6th and stuff like that, but uh, um, and, and talking oh. about civil war. But uh, Maggie Haberman's convinced that she's the savior of crazy. democracy, so that's... You're not going to escape some masturbatory elements in that writing, I think. Um, yes, Donald Trump is a felon many times over. But if he's actually hoisted by his own petard in this instance, pretty beautiful. We shall see. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Rachel Cohen to talk about housing. <laughs>
We are back, and we are joined now by Rachel Cohen, senior policy reporter at Vox, to discuss her piece, How State Governments Are Reimagining American Public Housing. Rachel, thanks so much for being here. Thank you guys for having me back. Of course. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, congrats, congrats on the new-ish gig at Vox. Um, hoping to read more and more about your reporting, or read more and more of your reporting over there. Uh, before we dive into some of the the more current elements of your piece, I wanted to talk a bit about the history of housing in this country and how we got to this point. I think we're at a a, a, a place where it, it's so unlivable for people right now that uh, we're at an inflection point. I would hope. I would hope things can't really get worse. But I, I, I guess starting in the 20th century to now, how do we get to this point? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I mean, I completely agree. And I was actually just reading an article about like, you know, within when if inflation does go down, our price is going to follow. And and it, the answer was like, yes, for some things, but probably not rent and probably not like restaurant prices and services. So I was like, oh, um, to your to your good question, though, um, basically, you know, the federal government actually wasn't really involved in housing before the New Deal, before the 30s. There was sort of increasing pressure in the 20s for them to get in that space, but um, for the most part, they they really didn't. And then, um, but there, there started to be this movement saying the federal government needs to step up, they need to do more. And there was this brief window where like what do more was kind of had a lot of possibilities and could have gone in a lot of different directions. And there were different voices in the room pushing uh, for some much more social democratic and sort of expansive and creative than what we ultimately landed on. Um, but at the time, what we ultimately landed on still felt big because they hadn't done anything. Anyway, federal government, starting with the New Deal, created the federal public housing program, but they limited it only to the very poor. They sort of put all these other um, restrictions on the program about the, like, the quality of architecture and design was was very limited um, compared to sort of public housing that exists in other countries. We had a, the stereotypes about what people have about public housing are are very much connected to the sort of rules and restrictions that Congress imposed on what those units could look like. Um, but you know, basically, they expanded. They were building around the country, and then HUD was created in the 1960s. And as a result of sort of the federal government taking a bigger role, um, states and local governments stepped back, which they were kind of happy to do because housing politics gets so messy. I'm sure uh, listeners of the show know the phrase NIMBY, not in my backyard. People fight affordable housing development. They think they have tons of you know racist and classist stereotypes about who lives in affordable housing and the risk of their own home going down. Um, so basically, we had a lot of we had an expansion. Of, we subsidized home ownership. A lot of people got homes, but mostly white people, mostly uh, you know higher class people. And then we ended up in a situation over the last basically four or five decades where we stopped building new homes. So we have more people available who can't. There's not enough homes to for them to go in the places they want to go. And then the homes that people do have are too expensive to afford and going up all the time, not matching wages. Um, so we both have a housing shortage and uh, we both, and housing is, is too expensive. And it's sort of the culmination of like, and, and on top of all of this, the federal government um, has really stepped back in, in building new housing and, and has the public housing program is stigmatized and they've stopped construction on that since the 90s. So, that's that's kind of the landscape of 2022, where there's like not enough housing. The federal government's not doing really enough at all, and state and local governments have, have largely stepped back from kind of taking a leadership on this issue. When um, the HUD was developed, or even before that, when the federal government began to uh, have involvement in in housing, and I guess it was like the Housing Acts of uh, of 37, and I'm forgetting the other year that it, um one of them was but um the w was reserving it for the poorest a deliberate 
action to essentially cloister this program so that it wouldn't expand more? Or was it more of um, a, a way to actually target acute poverty? I guess I'm wondering what the motivations right. were, because obviously it contributed to the stigmatization that we saw in the 80s and 90s and allowed for Reagan and Clinton to bleed it dry. But, um, you know, it, I'm wondering what the the right. reasoning behind it uh, was. So uh, I think, because I know we do have some of these debates sometimes now, at the time, I think sort of, it's very fair to say, like, a big reason that they ended up limiting it to just the very poor was because um, the real estate industry and businesses, they didn't want to have to compete with the federal government on building houses. They were sort of getting all this new infusion of, of financing also from the New Deal. And um, so if the federal government is going to step into building housing like let's limit sort of they, they convinced them that the best way to do it would be to sort of just target this population like we'll handle everyone else although like what we've seen is they are not they've not handled everyone else and and everyone else is still struggling and the result of that is you know uh the the people not well served by the private market also kind of resent the public housing because they're not being served by the government um so i think to your point um it's not that like there are some times I think where means uh, tested programs are, you know, are not created with like ill intent or, or, or hoping it will fail the population. Um, but I think in this case, it was definitely uh, an example of like powerful interests sort of convincing the federal government, like, don't, don't extend your reach too broadly here. We, we want to be in that market. And was it also a way to, to, I, uh, continue to section off certain populations from others uh, what was this part and um part of the the redlining uh push that we saw during this time period um yeah i think i think like there there were definitely ways in which the, pub, the way that the public housing program was sort of implemented uh helped to keep residential segregation intact and certainly the way private the private home ownership um, market developed with like subsidizing the suburbs i mean today the suburbs are much more diverse but i think there's a reason why the leave it to beaver 1950s lily white picket fence image is so powerful in people's heads because for like you know four decades that really was kind of like the image of the suburbs now now it's it's changed, but I think even as suburbs have grown much more diverse, we still have that image of like, oh, suburbs are for white people and, 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 you know, cities are for black people. And that's obviously not true at all. But um, I think that's all sort of wrapped up in this history of public housing and private home subsidizing. And so we, you know, the, the sixties end. there's this mass panic about cr uh, crime, right, we move right. into the seventies and then particularly in the eighties, the Reagan administration and the Clintons in the nineties, um, even though HUD was established and maybe had this brief moment in the sun, Reagan in particular completely decimates HUD's, uh, budget and, um, was there any it, it seems like there because the federal government spearheaded this and they were the ones at the forefront of this uh of, of creating public housing to this degree that s state governments and um and local governments weren't necessarily prepared to take this on is that an accurate assessment of how things kind of fell apart yeah, I think it's a mix of, I think both they sort of lack, I mean, to some extent they lacked capacity, but I also think like, you know, to some extent, I don't think they really wanted to take it on either. I mean, not that they wanted to like have their residents be without housing, but, um, you know, I, as one state legislator that I interviewed uh, about this in Rhode Island put it like, you know, their election cycles are every two years their their neighbors and constituents are are nimbies themselves often enough like they are the same sort of dynamics that like make it hard to build new housing like you hear about these city council meetings where people turn out to fight any bit of development or apartment or or any kind of affordable unit for low income people 
um, those same people are the people voting for the state and local politicians. So it's like, it takes, I think, I think what is good, and I guess we'll get more into this later, but like, I think there, we're starting to see a bit more leadership, <laughs> but a lot of it, I would say, is it was easy for um, politicians on the state and local level to sort of not be, to be like, well, that's the federal government's job. And it's really politically hard because to do the right thing in a lot of these situations is you you have to basically say to someone like, yeah, the, the value, the, the appreciation of your property may go down, but this is the right sort of thing to do if we're trying to build inclusive, stable cities. And that's really hard for a politician to do, although it's like what they have to do, I think. And and then you see, kind of see uh, the the beginning of this proliferation of like private management of public housing in certain urban areas. And um, the I, we can talk about that a bit, but I, I didn't want to delay too much before we got to your story to see how states are responding to this. But I think that devolution is important to understand how we got to this point right now. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, um, so, oh yeah, go on. A little bit oh, of a no, lag no, for you. Apologize. Um, no, okay, no. so yeah, so now your story talks a bit about how um, Rhode Island, in particular, the state legislature in June approved this new pilot program for meant to target housing. Um, can you talk a bit about that program and what makes it different um, and what makes it encouraging? maybe something that other states could follow. Um, yeah. And, and I should say, and this was my story and I, and I feel bad about it, but it's, it's certainly, it only adds to the thing. I actually learned following my story coming out, my story looked at a couple of states, Rhode Island was a big one, Colorado, Hawaii, California. Um, it turns out like three years ago, Massachusetts actually I think they were, I think Massachusetts was first and that they have been doing on a smaller scale. Um, but what they've been doing, which is, which is really new, some, like arguably not done since pre new deal is they are, the state is stepping up saying we're going to put money in to develop our own, develop new mixed income housing, affordable and market rate. And we're going to own it. And, and we're going, that's going to be, and I think something to understand is that, and you kind of briefly mentioned this earlier, but in the 1990s, Congress uh, like basically effectively made it so that it's really, really hard now to build any new federal public housing due to something called the Fair Cloth Amendment. Um, that's something Alexander Ocasio-Cortez has been trying to repeal, um, but it is still around. And so it's why um, I mean, right now with federal public housing, there's tens of billions of dollars in backlog repairs. That's where the leaky roofs and the clogged toilets and the mold and the asbestos, all that stuff that's not getting repaired. Congress isn't, is behind in funding those repairs, but they also are not building new units. We're, we're, we're fighting to maybe keep the units we have intact and out of disrepair. So what is really ex what's really interesting and to me exciting about what's happening in those states I was mentioning earlier, like Rhode Island, is they're saying, okay, the federal government can't build new public housing for all the reasons we just talked about, but we are, are going to invest ourselves and we are going to build new housing and we're going to own it, which is really sort of kind of, you know, a very different way of thinking about housing because a lot of times the way affordable housing development has kind of worked in the past is like they've been on these like 15, 20 year subsidy things and the government will, will basically give tons and tons of subsidies to a private company and then the private company will build it and they will be under certain restrictions about how high they can charge in rent. But then after the 15, 20 years runs up, then it's out of their hands and then becomes and then, you know, might not even stay affordable after that and it can become in, a, in the private hands. So this is like new in the sense that they're building housing and they're saying, and we're gonna keep it. And we're gonna also capture all the value that comes from owning that you know, unit. And we might be able to reinvest that in more housing production or other social services. And so I find it like a very interesting example of how the public sector is thinking about flexing its muscles 
proposals that they haven't really done in a very long time. Well, I mean, it's just it, it's common sense, frankly, to if taxpayer money not to use a, 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 an old, I guess, you know, small C conservative political term. But if taxpayer money is going towards the subsidization of this, then the government should should own it. They should be the public developer of this project as opposed to just subsidizing it under private management, which is wildly inefficient. But it's just a way to to get around the easiest answer to these questions, which I think a lot of members of our government don't actually want to reckon with. It reminds me of, I use this example all the time, during COVID, Nancy Pelosi bending over backwards for co COBRA subsidies as opposed to temporary ex temporarily expanding Medicare because, right. you know, we can't do that because of what that might lead to as opposed to just doing what's most straightforward. And And I think, I do think part of what's happening here is, you know, Public housing, federal public housing, doesn't have a great reputation right now. Um, I think part of that is because, you know, of, of rules and, and, you know, defunding that Congress has done. Um, and it doesn't mean all public housing has to be bad. We have strong models elsewhere, and some some states do a better job than others. But what it, but what it has meant is that people, there's a lot of skepticism right now that the government can can get in the housing game and do it well. And like that there's, there's a, well, they think of the Robert Taylor homes in Chicago, which is sort of like the notorious example of, of you know, segregated, underfunded, problematic towers. Um, and so part of what I think is, for all the people who are who are getting into this space, they're saying, look, yes, mistakes were made. Yes, we know there are all these problems with the federal housing program, but that doesn't mean we can't get it right. And that doesn't mean we're, we're doomed to make the same mistakes again. And so I think a lot of what's happening now and a really sort of very competent kind of successful uh, place where this is happening is in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, and that's at the county level. But like that's a place where they are showing how you how this can be done, how it can be done in the kind of apartments you or I would probably love to live in, like next to transit, really nice looking. You can't even you wouldn't even know it's public housing in the traditional sense of what we sort of imagine that to look like. Um, and I think part of what this will require is just getting like some more proof points like Montgomery County, like maybe like Rhode Island, more like Massachusetts and Colorado and Hawaii to sort of help people kind of shake the stereotype of what they think American governments building housing can look like and mean, because we have such a stigmatized image based on, you know, how the federal program has, has kind of shaken out. Well, the f federal program, they've made it anemic, and then they say, well, it's unfixable. And so we exactly. are, we're, we're putting a moratorium on it. And when you talk about Montgomery County, um, that is a suburb, right? And and so that I think changes uh, uh, the the conversation around public housing as well, um, and also just the outcomes because right. we've seen urban sprawl, people having to move out of the cities in order to afford a place to live, um, and it, when you I think make public housing more widespread as opposed to confines to certain areas of the cities. Then you're including middle class renters as well, as you write about, which m might make these programs more durable. Yeah, I, I think I think that's completely right. Like we have this idea of like public housing being this thing only in like low income, you know, uh, majority black neighborhoods in urban areas, which like is not I mean, it, it's like. We know the affordable housing crisis is affecting people all over. It's not limited to there. We can use, you know, governments can be helping people all over. I think that's why, you know, um, the the thing that most that a lot of lawmakers were, were basically saying was like, we just uh, this crisis is so bad. We need to be more aggressive about how we get involved. Um, and I think you're right that like showing that we can kind of showing that you can you can you can do this in rural areas, you can do this in suburbs, you can do this in cities, and and it could benefit, um, you know, some people would probably live in those units and pay market rent, which will help keep it going. And you, 
we also know that there are so many middle class families who are really struggling with housing right now too. This is definitely not only limited to the very poor, but we have a problem right now where there's just not even enough units for people to live in as they're you know, grow families and, and population goes up. So I think there's a lot of potential for this. Of course, like, you know, it will require um, capacity and like, and planning and skills and, and federal investment would be helpful. I think that was something that I kind of heard from people, which was saying like, they're hoping that if they can kind of show they have a good, that they can do this on the state level, that will then, then HUD hopefully will, you know, there's things HUD can do to support um, the state and local governments that want to pursue this, and and uh, hopefully they're paying attention. <laughs> you mentioned the Faircloth Amendment, and I just I, I've we we've talked about it on the show before, but I'm hoping that we can refresh the audience's memory here because this really is. Um, I'm I, I'm encouraged by your piece about these local governments and uh, coming up with creative solutions here, and it seems really promising. But from a federal level, it is jarring how um, it's for, been been for two decades that there has been essentially a moratorium on the construction of any new federally funded public housing, which I don't know if people are aware of. Yeah, honestly, I hadn't been aware of it until like two years ago, and I had been writing about housing for much longer than that, which is, I mean, it's my fault, but also it, it I think even people really active in housing are, I, I think ASD has been really helpful in bringing more attention to it. Um, but I, it also speaks to something that um, uh, is kind of connected to this is this, there's not really, outside of New York City, New York City is kind of the maybe the one major exception, there's not really a very organized constituency for public housing right now. Um, there's a big organized political constituency for the low income housing tax credit and other sorts of subsidized affordable construction and community development corporations and all these nonprofits that, that kind of want to capture those um, funds. But there, there's not a great uh, organized constituency for people calling to to overturn the fair cloth amendment to to build more public housing i think a lot of people probably have not heard of the rental assistance demonstration program or the rad program which is what the federal government since 2012 has basically been doing you kind of reference it to sort of uh convert traditional public housing into basically section eight uh vouchers which is you know a different program that is not that's that is still a one affordable housing program that we have, but it's on, in the private sector and it, or, you know, it's, it's connected with private um, landlords and it's not in the traditional public housing program. And I think, you know, there's sort of one thing that advocates for this new model and my story mentioned was they were saying, we're sort of hopeful that if we can get more states off the ground doing this in the next three to five years, then hopefully that will also create new constituencies that can then go to Washington and kind of, um, you know, make that case and be that voice that we don't really have in a great way right now. Last question. Um, the, the power of these real estate developers, um, I, I think, can't be understated. I'm, it's, it's fairly shocking that these states are standing up to them because it seems like our federal government can't. And uh, especially in a city like New York City, the the slumlord that, um, or maybe I shouldn't call him that, but fine, whatever, that uh, <laughs> was responsible for that massive fire that killed all of those people here in New York City was served on Eric Adams' transition committee, uh, or transition team, I should say. It, it's so deeply ingrained, particularly in these big cities that have become synonymous with gentrification like San Francisco and New York um, and Brooklyn in New York. So, um, I mean, if you don't mind just talking about how in your reporting you've uh, um, in encountered some of these big real estate groups and, and how much power they have over governments from the federal to the local level. Yeah, it's a good question. I think right now um, we don't have a we don't have a great sense right now over what this comp 
opposition will look like. I think a lot of them don't even necessarily know what's happening yet. Like it's sort of been kind of under the radar, that Rhode Island thing, you know, just passed in June. Colorado's was just this year too. Um, California's didn't pass, but like uh, did, you know, they think it stands a shot next year. Hawaii's just passed this year. So um, to, to some extent, we're going to have to sort of wait and see. I think there are some aspects about it that might, um, like, while they might not be able to own the properties, which they might, you know, there are opportunities in Montgomery County, I think is kind of demonstrating this where like, you could still have a private company build it. So you could, the government could still hire, you know, a private developer to do the actual construction. Um, but then it would be under, like, they probably do that with schools too, but then it's under um, public ownership at the end. And so I, I think it will be kind of interesting to see how we shouldn't be naive about this. I think like, as, as I think your point and I completely agree, but there are ways in which um, it would, it will be sort of interesting to see how state and local government sort of manage their local lobbies, because you could sort of get things through potentially by saying, well, we'll still work with you, you know, even if you won't have this. And I don't know, it, I, I really don't know right now how they're going to fight it. I think there's such a, it, it might really depend. So far, the lawmakers who've kind of done it have just been like, we need to be more aggressive. We need to try more things. Um, and I kind of hope they keep that spirit as opposition likely, up, you know, increases over time in different forms. Well, uh, Rachel Cohen uh, of Vox, I really appreciate your time today, Rachel. Uh, oh, yeah. You can read her piece on this called How State Governments Are Reimagining American Public Housing. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your great questions. Okay, of course. <laughs> um, with that said, uh, we are going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we will be joined by Jessica uh Pre Preheim, I'll get that right in a second, Vice President of Strategic Planning and Public Affairs at the Houston Coalition for the Homeless. We are back and we are joined now by Jessica Preheim, Vice President of Strategic Planning and Public Affairs at Houston Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, Jessica, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so uh, the work that you guys have, have done and the outcomes that you've had, it's been really remarkable. Um, uh, Houston's the fourth largest city in the, in the United States and since um your organization has has been spearheading this i think since 2011 2012 um you've decreased homelessness in houston by over 60 percent that is incredible i really i guess want to i want to start with how did you do it <laughs> yeah absolutely it has been a journey um uh you know i will say we didn't start here <laughs> this is uh in 2011 we had one of of the um, worst uh, numbers of homelessness in the United States. Um, we had the sixth largest, in fact, close to, you know, at any point in time, over 9,000 individuals were experiencing homelessness. And at the same time, we were giving back money. <laughs> so, we, you know, we were, we were really at a critical point. Um, and with that, you know, HUD declared us a priority city that um, for a lot of people sounds like something really good, but it's actually something really bad. Uh, that says you have to get you have to get it together. 
Uh, we also had a, a very, very strong mayor in East Parker at the time who said, we are going to come together and think differently. So in 2011, I know we were kind of ahead of some cities. We really came together and said, we are gonna have one strategy. We have a lot of really amazing service providers. We have a lot of really amazing funders and we're all doing really amazing things on our own and it is not getting us where we need to be. So, you know, we intentionally kind of came together and we said, uh, we had a community shred. We said out of this, we are going to identify what our problems are. We're going to be honest about it. And we are going to commit to really having a coordinated path forward. And so, you know, that was really the kind of impetus to get us, you know, moving in the right direction. Um, it's an it's a process that never ends. <laughs> so to this day, that coordination and that embedded funding is a part of what we do. And basically what your, your guys' group uh, said you did this radical thing where you said this, the uh, the solution for homelessness is giving people homes and not making it uh, a condition about you know, getting clean before you're helped, which a lot of religious programs do or addiction programs do, making uh, it contingent upon your drug use. That was not uh, what what your organization focused on. How much of that was a conscious choice on on your end? Absolutely, 100%. Um, housing is the end to homelessness. Um, and, you know, I think there is a misconception about housing first. It is not housing only. Housing first is absolutely not housing only. I kind of like to say, you know, like, we all have our own demons. We all have our own things that we battle on a daily basis, you know, myself included. And I have the luxury to do it behind a closed door. <laughs> I have the luxury to, you know, have a space to process. And so, you know, we really said we are going to house our most vulnerable folks. We're going to house our folks that are circling, you know, in and out of hospitals who are going in and out of justice because justice system because they're, you know, on the streets. We're going to put them in their housing. We're going to give them housing. We are going to have tenant protections for that person. They're going to have a lease in their own name. And then we as a homeless response system are going to be responsible for continually being there to offer support services. And that was a shift. Um, it was it was a shift from going to earning housing to being to have housing and making it the homeless you know response system's responsibility to support you to maintain that housing. And the results were, you know, they were instant. You know, people stay housed uh, with that philosophy and they get markedly more stable. Uh, and, you know, that's really what we're aiming for. It's a major source of stability that then you can. Uh then you can work on treating other problems, of course. But once you take the homeless part away, I mean, it makes things, those mountains so much easier to climb. And, and you know, I, I was reading uh, the New York Times write-up about your organization as well. And just the, the, the people, when homeless people are out of sight, out of mind to them, don't necessarily realize, like... The, a, a $10 Planet Fitness membership is necessary for people to be able to shower or charge their phone. Um, people sleeping in cars in different public spaces. Like, just because you're choosing not to think about homeless people doesn't mean that the their needs and aren't ne being sought to be met in other areas where it could have just been solved by if they had a shower in their home, there you go, right? And then these other... Uh, issues that people perceive that they would largely go away and then you could deal with say if there are addiction or health issues um at, is that in your experience uh accurate yeah absolutely i mean it imagine trying to get a job when it requires you to have clean clothes and like you said a shower where are you going to do that <laughs> you know if you're you're trying to you need an id and you don't have anywhere for them to you know the the automotive, you know, the state to mail it to you. What are you going to do? Having that place is just the fundamental part of all of our lives, that home base and stability just goes from there. I, you know, we see our folks stay housed and they earn income and, you know, they asking people to solve all their problems while living on the streets isn't feasible in 99% of the time. I'm, you know, it, it is that that roof is something that you just cannot take for granted. 40% of people who are homeless nationally have a job, too. So it's about that added stress of one. It's just a massive indictment on our systems. 
but it's also about the the stress of maintaining that and that i should say that differs from the chronically homeless which is a, a different category which um i'm wondering if you could parse out the differences between being homeless or being classified as being homeless versus being say chronically so um and how your organization responds to those different categories yeah you know i always like to say by the time you're homeless every other system has failed you <laughs> um one system or another has failed you if it's child welfare if it's just if it's education whatever it is you've been failed by all those safety nets um you know there's individuals who have fallen into homelessness um number one cause of homelessness is loss of income and you know those folks we don't have a one size fits all approach to homelessness here you know we really think through uh you know what are the intervention types that are going to get people out of homelessness as quickly as possible with you know, the lightest touch possible so people who are falling into homelessness they might just need a few months rent and then they are able to you know to pay the rent for you know, ongoing themselves, and we will never see them. They'll never experience the homelessness again. There are some individuals who've been, been homeless for a really long time. Uh, those are the individuals who often have a disability. Um, they often have other barriers. They may have no credit. They may have a criminal background just as a result of being homeless. Um, and so those are individuals that we consider to be, you know, chronically homeless. Um, and we really here as a homeless response system know that we want to be there to provide that permanent solution. Uh, so we have partnerships with, we kind of call it the three-legged stool. You know, you have your safe place to live. You have some subsidy to pay and help supplement some of your rent. And you have the case management supports to make sure that you're able to maintain your housing. And so that's really, we target that heavier intervention to individuals who have that long-term homeless. Um, and we do use, you know, we have a standardized assessment of who gets that resource. Um, you know, it's not agency A can kind of cherry pick and say, hey, you know, Bob's in front of me. I'm housing Bob right now. We really say, guess what? Um, the next person on the wait list based on their vulnerability um, is, is Fred. And so, uh, we're going to, you know, you're going to house Fred today and we are going to continue to work with Bob, uh, and make sure that he has the resources he needs as well. So it's kind of a, it's a mental shift, uh, to think about how you prioritize people into housing and really trying to remove the, that, just that philosophy of having to earn it. <laughs> um, and just yeah. everyone yeah. deserves housing. And, and I think some, uh this is not me but i'm curious how you respond to somebody who says well what about shelters people already have shelters and they can go there if they need um how is your how is what you set up in terms of dignified housing different than that of going to a shelter yeah we have shelters here most of our shelters are privately funded uh we made the decision to invest in the permanent solution a shelter is not a permanent solution to homelessness. It's a really expensive intervention that is needed. It is a crisis, you know, it is a necessity that our community needs, but it's not ending anyone's homelessness. Someone will go into a shelter and they still need the what's next. And we invested in the what's next from day one. Um, it's less money, uh, it serves more people, and it actually gets people to the resolution they need. Uh, so we really haven't. Um, I think we were faced with this when COVID hit. A lot of other communities really kind of thought they invested in, you know, motels, hotels, non-congregate shelter. You know, we for a moment had a, this moment of pause where we thought, should we go that route or should we take these resources and get people where they need to go long term? And, you know, we we for a second kind of paused and said, no, we're we're going to invest in the permanent solution. We are going to invest in you know a lease in someone's name if it's the deposit and you know six months rent a year rent that's what we're going that's going to end their homelessness not putting someone into you know a non-congregate shelter and, and i mean you say the deposit there right like note look at how big that gulf is in between say if somebody um just lost their job and their paycheck to paycheck and they have to go through their savings in order to make up some, um, or to, to make payments, et cetera. And they don't have the money for a deposit. I mean, these rental markets are so crazy right now that 
no problem for uh, an upper middle class person to give a full month's rent as a deposit for an apartment uh, and, and go through a credit check and wait for, I don't know, seven days for, for an approval for an apartment. But for somebody who may have fallen into a circumstance where it's precarious, that, that is a, a way too big of a fault line for so many people in this country and uh, particularly in a big city like Houston, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us are living, you know, one paycheck away from a disaster. And when that one paycheck happens, homelessness is often a result. And, you know, one thing that we really try to be is intentional with with our services. Uh, We uh, try to rethink how can we stretch every dollar as much as possible, which I think makes Houston really unique. Um, in that we all figure out our niche. So we have a landlord engagement team. They go out and they recruit. We know that it's hard to find quality affordable housing units across this nation and it's getting harder. Uh, So we have teams that really have those conversations with property owners that say, hey, guess what? I have someone who has pretty bad credit or no credit. They might have a criminal background. If we can pay you, you know, an incentive fee, will you just waive all that? And a lot of the properties say yes. And, you know, we become the case manager for the landlord. And in turn, they say, we're going to house your client. So a lot of the homeless response systems responsibility in Houston is also to kind of be that uh, that conductor behind the scenes. You know, we're air traffic control. We figure out what the barriers are. We try to act always on behalf of our clients um, and to really figure out how we get all of our partners needs met, which includes our property owners. And, and to pay those things. So uh, I, I guess I was, um, I'm curious a bit about what things were like before your organization made such a big dent, because I know that Houston had a lottery system that was a ba- basically window dressing to help homelessness. Um, can you talk a bit about the, the, the era before your, your organization's work began um, and how difficult it was for really anybody who was homeless to get approved through the system. Yeah, you know, it was often your ability to get housed was the door that you walked through. Um, So if I walked into an organization and the first person I met with had been working with homelessness for 30 years and they knew everyone in this city, they were probably going to get me housed. But if I walked into the office next door and met with someone who just got their social work degree and is 22 and right out of college and doesn't have those connections, I'm probably going to remain homeless. Um, You know, we, even in the beginning of this, met and mapped out all the different steps that it took uh, to get someone housed. Uh, We started with veterans. We mapped it out. There were 76 individual steps that we made someone go through to get housed. And this is for, you know, veterans who had access and qualified for rental assistance and case management services. And so we really, you know, had to step back and be like, is that efficient for any person, any human? Is that efficient for organizations? And why are we doing it? You know, that really just having those conversations, but all the barriers that we self-imposed, you know, really was able to kind of open up the door to these larger collaborations. You know, we... It's rare. I I don't think I've ever met anyone who says that they don't want to end homelessness. (laughs) We don't always speak the same language. (laughs) And, you know, I think that cuts across like, you know, all party lines. Like we, we sometimes use the wrong words to describe what we want, but we all want the same thing. And we have to open up that dialogue to be able to make progress. And that's what we've really tried to do here. But do real estate developers really want the same thing? Like, what has been your experience in Houston? Because I'd imagine that's a pretty powerful lobby um, that does not want to deal with uh, with any of this. It's getting harder for us. Um, I think it's getting harder everywhere. Uh, but, you know, property owners care about their bottom line. And if you as a system can say, hey, guess what? I'm going to be paying your rent. Um, I am going to be paying your deposit and you're going to actually have a guarantee that there's going to be someone here to support your client should they have issues. Because sometimes we don't have the best unit. Sometimes it's a, you know, a C, C class unit um, versus an A or B. It might not be the, you know, $3,000 a month condo. Um, and they have natural turnover. So part of us, we really do 
play to the bottom line of properties. So they might not say, and I want to end homelessness, but they might also say, hey, I really need to make sure that I am making a profit on this property. And so we really kind of approach every one of our partner of understanding and asking the questions of like, what matters to you? And how are we actually saying the same thing? Um, because most of the time we are. Lastly, um, I, I guess, you know, I'm struck by your approach in contrast to say cops breaking up encampments and just, you know, can't be here, go somewhere else. We don't really care where you go, but it all being about this, the city aesthetic and not wanting to necessarily deal with the problem. Um, when you see some of these images around the country, what's really your response to that? Because it seems like, it, it seems frankly like your your work should be duplicated throughout the, the, the country. And in some of these instances, it's just, it, it's maddening. You know, it is here, we've really taken the approach that in police, our police partners are our partners, but we want to be intentional. There is moving an encampment and dispersing people doesn't end their homelessness. We take the exact same approach. We really are intentional to be like, hey, you know, there's an encampment over here of 30 people. We don't go in on day one and say, hey, tomorrow this is going to, you know, this is going to be moved. We do have a very intentional encampment response. We do address encampments. But what we do is kind of say, holistic, these are people here. <laughs> we go in, we get the name of everyone who's there. We know, um, you know, if they have untreated health conditions. We know if they have an ID. We know what their criminal, you know, backgrounds could be or some of their barriers or if they have income. And we spend a lot of time um, leading up to an encampment closure just to say, like, I'm going to get to know you. We're going to have a by name list. I'm going to continue to let you know, hey, in two weeks or in a month, this encampment is going to be closed and we have a housing option for you. <laughs> we do not close an encampment unless we have a housing option to offer someone. Otherwise, it just moves, it moves the problem all around the city. It doesn't actually address homelessness. That has been one of our biggest tools is if we close an encampment, we are here to offer you a housing option and people say yes. <laughs> That's another, I think, misconception is that people will say no. Um, you know, we've on our encampments, um, we've been able to close 57 encampments uh, since COVID hit. So that's a lot. Um, and 90% were housed. <laughs> Some people self-resolved and sometimes that's a conversation of, hey, we're here every day. We're going to help you reconnect with mom <laughs> and you can go back, um, you know, so they they were no longer homeless. Um, so, you know, we just we just embed housing as the solution to homelessness in everything we do. And that takes eh, it just takes a lot of conversation um, and it takes making people who you think aren't your partners, your partners. So how can people help um, Houston Coalition for the Homeless? What can our viewers do, uh, say, if they want to help your organization, but also to get involved in their communities to take some of these practices? I think it's really, you know, helping and encouraging a system approach. Um, you know, I think it's supporting um, and advocating for kind of a single coordinator of of a homeless response system. I don't, you know, countries don't usually function well if they had six presidents, <laughs> um, but you sometimes need, you know, one person who can really be, or one organization that can be really trying to, you know, coordinate. So I think it's figuring out who the lead agency is. I think it's supporting. Um, I also think um, about not necessarily saying, hey, you know, everything we're going to give is just is goods, but sometimes it's expertise of the community. <laughs> like, do you have expertise in building affordable housing? Do you have expertise in employment? Um, you know, thinking a little differently as a community about what giving looks like um, it is really important. You know, I, I think we, you know, I, you know, if I'm really good at grant writing and I can go to a small nonprofit and say, hey, like, let's figure out how we can strengthen your abilities. I think those things are really, really powerful. Like people's, you know, collective impact. Um, and, you know, at the lead agency, we're always here to, to help people navigate uh, giving. Um, but I think it's also encouraging elected officials to mandate partnerships. Like, don't, don't make it a... Don't make it an option. 
because sometimes options people say no like say like hey make these people talk make these people collaborate and support that when it happens um, well can't can't thank you enough for your time today and it was really awesome to hear more about your work uh, jessica preheim vp of strategic planning and public affairs at houston coalition for the homeless thanks so much for your time today really appreciate it thank you all right, with that said, we are going to head into the fun half of this program. We'll be taking your call. I was about to say we're Bender and Brandon, but it's not Thursday. It's only Wednesday. But now that it's Wednesday, we understand that Left Reckoning has moved back to its rightful place on Tuesday. And you had an episode last night. Yep, Ben Spielberg on. We talked about the uh, half loaf, so-called. Um, ben calls it more of a 17 to 21 percent loaf uh that we got with the infrastructure reduction act made us made a stronger case for the uh, tax enforcement stuff um um but also talked about how at a certain point um we're going to need to be able to flex a muscle and like for instance not allow them to pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill so they can gut this even more and give us and it's not just that like birdie didn't get what he wanted it's that and this is what like you should remind sort of more normie and democratic apologist, um, you know, progressives is that Joe Biden and like even like Kamala, like what they said they wanted from um, infrastructure and, and climate, like this is just not even close to that. Um, so we talked a little bit about what's in the bill and also the strategy and how uh, the progressive caucus can, you know, be a little bit stronger uh, last night, patreon.com slash left reckoning. Also in the post game, uh, I did the first installment of uh Matt argues with an asshole uh, going through an uh, argument I had with a Stephen Crowder fan. Uh, I was about, about to say, you finally had Larry Sharp on? Well, it's like about a 60-year-old uh, Stephen Crowder fan, which is depressing enough, but uh, he uh, believes some hysterical things about trans kids. And uh, and uh, and so uh, I had to argue with him. So patreon.com just left for reckoning to get access to that. All right. Well, 646-257-3920 will be taking your calls and your reading your IM. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun Matt. You. Fun What is up, everyone? Fun hat. No, me key. You did it. Fun hat. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hat. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, seven, eight? Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start right. Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge map. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 1 half. 38 911, for instance. $3,400, $1,900, 654, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. <laughs> On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I 
don't know. But you should know. People just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. Gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. 